this is part two of the circulatory system video. We're going to focus on measurements to monitor your circulatory system health. So we're going to focus first on the cardiac cycle. You've basically already seen it. It's the sequence of events of the blood going into the right side, being pumped out of the right side, going to the lungs, and basically coming back to the left side to be pumped out of the body. Um, we're going to focus mostly on the, um, the muscle movement and the signals that are sent throughout the heart to basically tell your heart when to relax and when to squeeze, when to contract so blood can move around. Um, so the cardiac cycle to basically relax and squeeze and go through an entire cycle over and over again, um, one cycle takes about um, 0.8 seconds, 0.8 seconds. And it's usually divided into um, two phases. There's the diastole, which is when the ventricles are relaxed. And there's also the systole, which is when, when the ventricles contract. So they're squeezing. So diastole, relaxing. Systole, contraction, squeezing. Okay. Um, and so this image here just highlights um, what happens. So here we have diastole when your ventricles are, uh, when your chambers are relaxed. And so chambers can fill with blood when they're relaxed because they're not squeezing stuff out. Um, here we have atrial systole. Um, atrial systole basically means that the atria are squeezing blood into the ventricles and the ventricles they're doing diastole meaning they are relaxed so they can accept um, blood um, and then here we have atrial systole um, or atrial diastole where the atria are no longer squeezing um, and the ventricles though they are um, squeezing we have systole here ventricular systole um, so that squeezes the blood out of the ventricles and in, into the lungs or into the body depending on which ventricle um, you are uh, at so we're gonna start off by taking a look at the steps of the cardiac cycle the heart begins in a state of diastole where the heart is relaxed um, and so in that state um, blood can enter the atria the right atria atrium and the left atrium um, because they're relaxed uh, and as the blood fills uh, the atria what's going to happen is the AV valves will open because there's going to be some pressure and that pushes them open and the blood can start flowing in um, and so that's step two and then what's going to happen is the uh, atria are going to enter a state of systole where they squeeze some of the blood into the um, ventricle so they squeeze some of the blood into the ventricle um, now once the um, ventricles are filled with blood uh, the AV valves, there's going to be a lot of pressure and that's going to shut the AV valves and it's going to prevent the um, blood from moving back into the atria. Um, and the reason that they, that they shut as well is because the pressure is so high um, due to uh, not just the amount of blood in there but because the ventricles actually started to squeeze. So the ventricles started to squeeze and that shut the AV valve shut to prevent the um, blood from basically flowing backwards. Um, but the point is that that's the beginning of ventricular uh, systole. So that's the beginning of ventricular systole, um, which means ventricular squeezing. Uh, so again, that squeezing caused the AV valves to shut, um, and the blood was being is being squeezed through the um, arteries. Now they go through the semi lunar valves, which are the ones that lead into the uh, arteries. Now, over time, the ventricles will start to relax. They'll go back into their um, diastole phase. The, the volume in the ventricles will start to increase um, and the pressure will start to decrease as a result, um, as a result of that. And because the pressure st starts to decrease, well, the semi semilunar valves are gonna shut um, to prevent the blood from flowing back into the ventricles instead. So as you can see throughout this cardiac cycle, um, pressure uh, shut valves and open valves at the right time so blood was not flowing uh, forwards and backwards and only really going in that one main direction and so this is the cardiac cycle after step five over here um, you would have it um, go back to the previous um, to the first step once again so you basically have filling of the atria um, left and right um, pressure builds and uh, the atria can squeeze more of the blood into the um, ventricles through the AV valves. Um, the ventricles will fill with blood 
And as the fill of blood, eventually the ventricles will reach a high pressure and start to squeeze. That shuts the AV valves and blood is basically going into the arteries through the seven lunar valves. As um, the uh, ventricles start to relax and the pressure decreases because of increased volume, the semilunar valves can shut um, to prevent the uh, blood from flowing backwards. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at um, what regulates this whole cardiac cycle. Where are the signals coming from? So this graph shows the picture from the previous slide along with the, um, the cardiac cycle and pressures. You can see that the heart during its uh, 0.8 second cycle stays um, in diastole for a longer period of time, about two thirds of its time in diastole, so two thirds of its time relaxing, and in systole about one third of its time, so not as long um, in systole. So one good trick that uh, people often use is um, to think of it like almost like the work day. You work for about 30 or a day, so eight hours, and then for the other two thirds of your day, you relax. So you come home from work and relax. Um, so you can see the pressure here in the uh, ventricles uh, during the uh, diastolic phase is very low. You'll see the pressure of the aorta doesn't increase that much, even though there is a systole for the aorta. It's not a big increase. It's still pretty relatively stable, um, but there is some increase there. On this side over here, you can see the increase in the um, ventricle pr pressure. Um, and then you can also see the uh, how that correlates with the blood pressure measurement. The blood pressure is the pressure in your arteries. And um, when you feel your pulse, you're feeling the pressure in your arteries. Um, and so you can feel the pressure in your arteries when your heart is... Um, squeezing, so when your ventricles are uh, contracting, for example, um, that's called your systolic blood pressure. And when your heart relaxes, um, the pressure that you feel in your arteries is called the diastolic blood pressure. And so usually your blood pressure is reported as two numbers, one number over another. The top one is when your heart's squeezing, the bottom one is when your heart is relaxing. Uh, so again, this, this graph here just shows you that 0.8 second cycle. Um, a large period of time is spent in diastole compared to systole, and it correlates with the image over here. So um, this is our cardiac cycle. Um, remember that the ventricles contract to pump blood out of the ventricles, so to go into the aorta, for example, or into the, uh, the pulmonary artery. Um, so you can see over here, um, during the cardiac cycle, about 0.3 seconds, um, you can see over here is the ventricular um, systole, so squeezing the blood out and the atria are relaxing. After those 0.3 seconds are over, you have 0.4 seconds where um, both the atria and ventricles are in diastole, they're both relaxing so that you can fill in that, um, that, uh, that ventricle. Um, and then for about 0.1 seconds, you have an atrial uh, systole and a ventricular diastole uh, where the atria squeeze some of the blood into the ventricles. And so that's the whole cycle that we saw. Um, and you can see over here uh, an adult human at rest with a heart rate of about 72 beats per minute. One complete cardiac cycle takes about 0.8 seconds. And that's for that typical adult. It could vary depending on various factors that we'll take a look at later on. Um, so a few little important points to remember is that um, pressure is higher in the ventricles. They're, they are just thicker. They're more muscular um, because they have to pump blood out of the heart. Um, the thickest ventricle, if you look carefully, is actually your, um, is actually your left ventricle. Um, and when you think about it, that makes sense because it has to pump blood throughout the entire body. So here I've just defined a few terms. So again, diastole is relaxing of either ventricles or atria. Um, so during, let's say, the first step of diastole, the AV valves are open and then blood can flow into the um, ventricles and the, um, the semilunar lunar valves are closed because um, you're not really pumping anything out right now. Um, now atria are relaxed. They do have systole, as I mentioned earlier, um, but um, again, it's not nowhere near as high as the pressure you would see in systole of ventricles. So systole again is contraction, squeezing. Um, so you can have atrial systole to squeeze some of the blood into the ventricles and ventricular systole to squeeze the blood through the semilunar valves and then into the arteries to go either to the lungs or to the body. So we'll take a look at what 
regulates that squeezing and relaxing. It's actually a specialized uh, group of muscle tissue. Um, it starts over here in the right atrium. It's called the SA node, the sinoatrial node. Um, and what it does is it stimulates the muscle cells to contract and to relax in a rhythmic fashion. So we call this SA node the heart pacemaker. And it's found right here in the um, right atrium. And so what's going to happen is it's going to generate an electrical signal and that's basically going to tell the atria to, um, to squeeze, to enter systole. Um, so it's communicating to the right atrium and to the left atrium to squeeze, um, to uh, pump blood into the ventricles, the right and the left ventricle. And when that's happening, the um, AV valves are open. So again, that's not new information. The only thing new here is that there's this um, bundle of uh, specialized muscle tissue that's generating an electrical signal to basically squeeze your atria to go into atrial systole. So that signal from the uh, AV node is gonna propagate to um, this other area over here called, right over here, um, sorry, the signal from the SA node that we had over here is gonna, is gonna propagate to an area called the AV node just over here. Um, and that's basically going to propagate or travel to um, a special area in the um, septum called the bundle of hiss. And that signal will continue traveling down the septum and basically split onto both sides of the um, ventricle until it gets to a part called the Purkinje fibers. When the signal gets to the Purkinje fibers, that basically signals the um, contraction of the uh, right and the left ventricles almost simultaneously um, in order to push blood through the semilunar valves into the arteries. When that happens, the AV valves will shut to prevent um, blood from going backwards because the pressure is so high in the ventricles. Now the shutting of that AV valve is actually a sound that can be heard when your doctor uses a uh, stethoscope um, to listen to your heartbeat, to your, um, to your heart valves. Um, so when those valves shut, that's the first so sound of the heart. And we call that first sound the lub because your heart makes a sound kind of like this, lub-dub, lub-dub, lub-dub. And the lub again comes from the shutting of the AV valves due to the squeezing of the uh, ventricles caused by that signal in the Purkinje fibers. Now eventually, the, uh, the ventricles are gonna relax again um, and when the ventricles relax, the AV, the semilunar valves um, will now shut. And that shutting of the semilunar valves, that's your second heart sound called the dub. So lub is closing of the AV valves and dub is the closing of the semilunar valves. Uh, the lub is caused by ventricular systole. The dub is caused by ventricular diastole. And so those are the heart sounds that can be heard when your doctor uses a stethoscope in order to hear the uh, heart valves. And the idea is that this signal will happen in a rhythmic fashion. So the signal will start over again. We'll have the SA node, we'll have the um, AV node, we'll have the bundle of Hiss, and then we'll have the Purkinje fibers. So, As I already explained, the heart experiences sounds, the lub-dub sound, um, due to valves opening, uh, valves closing. Um, so again, we have the AV valves closing. That's our first sound. Now it's actually a bit of a double sound. Um, so it's a lub sound, but it's a bit of a double sound because the left valve does close a little bit before the right valve. Um, and then the second sound is the um, dub. And again, that's because of the semilunar valves that are shutting um, during the heart cycle. So lub, dub. Uh, so as I mentioned, the tool used to hear those um, valves open, uh, closing um, is called a stethoscope. Uh, so it's this device over here. And there's different positions you want to place them to hear the uh, different uh, valves uh, closing. So for example, if you want to hear the, um, the aortic valve closing, uh, you might want to place your stethoscope over here. Um, over here, if you want to hear your uh, tricuspid valve closing. Um, and so you can see the different positions on the chest over here. 
based on which valves you want to hear. Um, the reason that that's an important uh, diagnostic technique is because um, sometimes you can develop what's called a heart murmur, and that's when the valves um, are not closing properly, and you can actually hear that during this uh, diagnostic technique called an auscultation, which is basically listening for the heart sounds with a, with a uh, stethoscope. Um, so you can have a heart murmur where the valves aren't closing properly, and so blood is leaking um, basically in parts of the heart where it should not be going. And again, you can take a look at uh, this picture here that illustrates where to place uh, the stethoscope in order to hear the different valves of the heart. You can uh, watch these little video clips here um, in order to hear the what normal heart sounds sound like and also what abnormal heart sounds sound like. And again, here's our device called the stethoscope. So, as I mentioned, the SA node is called the heart's pacemaker. Um, it basically generates electrical um, signals in order to um, tell the atria and the ventricles to squeeze when they need to. Now, because these are electrical signals that are generated, you can actually put these electrodes on your skin um, in order to pick up on those electrical signals, and you could monitor those electrical signals um, using a tool called an ECG or EKG sometimes we call it um, which basically stands for electrocardiogram so it's a way to monitor that electrical activity of um, your heart through the SA node, AV node, um, the bundle of Hiss and then the Purkin G fibers um, that we discussed in the previous slide um, and so uh, it's a great way to see if your heart is actually sending those signals properly you, you should get this certain pattern um, based on uh, the electrical signals in your heart. And if this pattern is not working, if this pattern does not match what we expect of a healthy heart, then there could be something wrong. Maybe you're having a heart attack. Maybe your heart is um, not following the proper rhythm. And then we can act actually go in and um, do further diagnostic tests to see what the issue may be with your heart. And so we'll take a look at this um, ECG um, in a bit more detail in the next few slides. So, over here we can see the um, cycle that occurs uh, when your heart beats normally. Um, so you have different waves. You have a P wave, and that's basically when your um, atria are activated. Um, and then you have what's called the QRX, QRS complex, and that's when your ventricles are um, activated. Um, and then finally you have the T wave, which is basically your recovery wave uh, so that you can get ready for the next heartbeat. And so we record uh, the EKG, and you can actually print them out on these little strips over here. And that can tell you if your heartbeat is fast, slow, or if there's something irregular about it. So the key is looking for this pattern of this P, Q, R, S, and T waves. Um, and if you have those, that's good, but you want to see how many patterns you have within this little strip here. So notice this looks like a normal heartbeat. Um, but look, when you have a lot more of these patterns in there, that's a fast heartbeat. You have fewer than a normal heartbeat that's a slower heartbeat and then also if you don't have the way the um, patterns that you're looking for in the proper areas um, that could be an irregular heartbeat and that could be um, a symptom of some underlying condition that you might have to take a look at so again here we can see our uh, pattern for one cycle and then you can see it over a few um, seconds to see if your pattern is regular or not or fast or slow and we'll take a look at how to diagnose and analyze that. Uh, so one thing to notice is that in a normal, in a normal um, strip like this, uh, the uh, complexes, these over here, should be roughly the same distance apart from each other. That's what we're looking for usually um, to have when you have regular cycles. So it's a nice ryth uh, rhythmic uh, cycle. Um, now you can actually estimate a person's heartbeat or heart rate uh, so how fast the heart uh, beats per minute. Um, so oftentimes when you see BPM, that means beats per minute um, by looking at this strip here. And the idea is you want to count the number of times this repeats itself and you multiply by 10. Um, and the reason you multiply by 10 is because this is called a six second strip. It was taken over six seconds. So you, if here, if you have one, two, three, four, five, six, that's six. Um, cycles like this in um, in 10 seconds so sorry six cycles like this in six seconds so in 60 seconds so that's six times 10 that would be 60 
So you do 6 times 10, and that would be 60 beats per minute. So this person here has a um, heart rate of 60 beats per minute. Um, if you don't have an ECG or EKG, you could also um, monitor your um, heart rate by do measuring your pulse. So you can uh, feel for your pulse, and we'll see how to do that later on. Um, count the amount of um, uh, beats or uh, motion movements uh, that you feel um, for about 15 seconds, and you can multiply by four, or by for 10 seconds and multiply by um, six, um, and that works as well uh, to get your number of beats per minute. So if you take a look at this six second strip here, you can determine if you have a uh, slow heartbeat, which is called bradycardia, or a fast heartbeat, which is called tachycardia, or a normal one. So remember on the previous slide, we had 60 to 99 beats per minute is your uh, normal heartbeat. Um, so take a look at that. That also varies depending on um, many factors that we'll take a look at in a bit, but you can count how many times you see this uh, complex here. So we have three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's eight times 10, which is about 80 BPM beats per minute. And so based on our definition of normal, that's a um, normal uh, strip. Let's take a look here. We have one, two, three, four, five. Five times 10, that's 50. That's below that 60 range, that 69.9 range. So that's 50 BPM, um, which is a low, a slow um, heart rate. Uh, so that's called bradycardia, meaning your heart rate is not moving as fast as it should be going. And then let's take a look here. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. 12 times 10, that's 120 beats per minute. That is higher than that 60 to 1 to 99 range. So this is a uh, fast heart rate that's tachycardia. Um, over here we can see some abnormal ECGs or EKG readings. You'll notice there's no QRS complex over here. So there's some issue with the electrical signal. You definitely don't want to see this where you are um, almost flatlining over here. There's no more um, rhythm. Um, another type of measurement you can use if you don't have an ECG or EKG is your pulse. Um, and so your pulse is a way to let you know how many times your heart beats per minute. And so what you do is you use your fingers to feel the expansion of your arteries as blood goes through it. And you can use that kind of as a proxy um, for ventricular systole, which are basically your heart just beating. Um, and so you can, again, count this, for example, how many times you feel a pulse, uh, let's say, for 15 seconds. And if it's for 15 seconds, you multiply it by 4 to get it 60. So that's beats per minute. If you did it for 10 seconds, you'd multiply it by 6 to get it beats per minute. So if you felt six um, thumps in uh, 10 seconds, then you'd multiply that by um, uh, six, and that would be um, 36 beats per minute. That would be very, very low. Um, so this is one area you can feel it. You can feel it at the artery that's uh, near your thumb, and that's called the radial artery. Um, you don't want to use your thumb to feel that one because your thumb also has a pulse and so that can throw it off. So you usually want to use your um, index and um, middle finger to feel uh, in the radi radial artery area. You can also feel it in the carotid artery over here. Again, using your index and middle finger to um, feel for it gently uh, in the neck area. Um, same type of measurement. You could use something called a brachial artery over here. Um, so it's near the crease towards the middle of the body. Um, so we say medial towards the middle of the body. And same idea, you can feel that pulse once you feel it, um, and then start counting. And so these are different areas where you could feel the um, pulse. And again, all that pulse really is is the expansion of the arteries as, as blood um, rushes through it. And you can use that as a 
estimate of that um, beating um, of your heart. So why do you want to take your pulse? Well, again, we have a range here of normal blood pressure. Um, and so you have what's called a resting heart rate, which is basically how fast your heart uh, beats per minute um, when you're just resting, not really doing anything. Um, and so you want to monitor that because if that changes, it could mean that uh, maybe there's a disease, maybe there's something that changed in your life. Um, and so you can take a look at this over here. We have men over here and women over here. And you should be able to answer questions like, um, for example, which men, which group have the higher um, heart rates, men or women. You can also look at within each group. Um, you can look at the health of athletes versus people who don't really do any exercise. So if you look at the beast per minute of an athlete, for example, for someone aged 18 to 25, which is close to your age range, an athlete would have a 49 to 55 beat per minute um, range there. Um, now, if you look at somebody who um, has, uh, who doesn't do any exercise at all, you'll see that heart rate is really, is quite high. Um, if you go, as you age over here, you can see older people might have a little bit of a lower heart rate over here. But the main point is that when you're an athlete, you have a higher, um, you have higher beats per minute, higher heart rate, um, or lower heart rate, sorry. And when you're, um, not an athlete, you have a higher heart rate, higher beats per minute. And if you think about it, that basically means that your heart is working harder to pump blood. Um, if you're an athlete, your heart can pump a few times, get the blood around the body as needed very efficiently. But if you're not, well, you need to pump more to get that blood around the body more efficiently. Now, don't be too paranoid if your heart beat, if your heart rate does change. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you're dying, you're sick. It could just mean that maybe you're stressed out that day. You just did some kind of activity. You just maybe drank some coffee or, or had something in your diet that you're not used to. Um, so that's why it's important that when you monitor your health, you do an average of this. You don't just do it once and say that um, you know, you're know you suffering from a terrible disease. You need to make sure you keep an average record of these, um, these measurements. So again, blood pressure is just when blood flows through your arteries, it stretches the um, walls of your arteries and that's the pulse that you're feeling. So when we measure your um, blood pressure, so we measured so far the um, electrical activity of your heart, we measured the beats per minute through your pulse, um, something else you can measure is something called your blood pressure. And um, that blood pressure, like I said, is basically the blood pushing on the walls of your arteries. Um, and there's two measurements you'll get for blood pressure. So you'll get the systolic pressure, which is the highest pressure that you can feel in your arteries. And that's when your ventricle is contract, your ventricles are contracting. Um, and they're, 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 the pressure in your arteries is increasing to accommodate that surge of blood going through it. But you can also have what's called the diastolic pressure, which is when your um, ventricles relax. And so that's the lowest pressure that you can feel in your arteries specifically. Okay, so we're talking about pressure in arteries right now. Um, and so we have our systolic, which is heart contracting, and diastolic, which is um, the heart relaxing. The systolic pressure is the highest pressure you can feel in your arteries, and the diastolic pressure is the lowest pressure you can feel in your arteries. So in order to measure the blood pressure, um, there's a few tools you can use. You can actually get an electronic blood pressure monitor that can work just fine. Um, but you can also get, you can also use um, two items. You can use the, the um, stethoscope that we mentioned earlier, and then you can use the um, Schwigmo manometer. It's basically a blood pressure cuff. So you've probably seen this before. You wrap it around your arm and then you um, squeeze this bulb here to let air in and basically squeeze and stop the blood circulation in your arm. And what you do is you slowly release that pressure and listen for sounds. You listen for sounds. And when you hear a sound, that will indicate when your blood pressure um, has basically gone higher than the number on this dial here. So it basically tells you what your blood pressure is. So you, you wrap your arm up in this, um, you squeeze it to stop the blood flow, you listen for sounds as you release the blood pre as you release the um, pressure here, um, and when you hear sounds, that's basically your blood pressure number. I'll show you another image later on to um, to be able to uh, understand how that works in more detail. But just understand we use the two tools: blood pressure cuff, stethoscope, to listen for sounds as we stop the blood flow in your arm and then let it continue again. 
So uh, we'll talk about the measurement first, the actual numbers. Um, blood pressure is measured in something called millimeters of mercury or MMHG, which just means millimeters of mercury. Um, and we report two numbers. We report that highest number I mentioned earlier and the lowest number I mentioned earlier. And so we have systolic over diastolic. So for example, this person here has a blood pressure of 120 over, um, over 80. And so we read it as 120 over 80. When we say that, you know that that means that you have your systolic on top and your diastolic at the bottom. So basically when you're measuring your um, blood pressure, uh, you're going to hear two sounds. Um, so first you're going to squeeze to cut the circulation in your arm, and then you're going to release that, that pressure, um, and you're going to be lis listening with a stethoscope to um, hear sounds. And so the first sound that you hear, um, that's going to be your systolic um, pressure. Um, and then you're going to continue, you're going to continue um, until this uh, sound basically disappears. Um, and so when that sound disappears, then that's going to be your diastolic pressure. So the first sound is your systolic pressure, and then when your sound disappears, that's when you know you hit your diastolic pressure. Um, and you'll have a little um, dial that'll kind of move, and you'll basically read the numbers when you hear the first sound, and when that sound um, first disappears. And those two numbers will be your systolic and diastolic pressure, respectively. So um, here we have uh, an example, a practice problem. Um, so we have uh, our dial over here, our measurement. Um, this is sa it said that we heard our first sound um, at this point here. So it's about 122. So 122 millimeters of mercury, mmHg. And uh, that sound stopped uh, about over here. That's the last time we heard the sound. Um, and so that looks like it's about uh, 71. So 71 millimeters of mercury. And so what you would say is that this person's blood pressure is um, 122 over 71. And so you can try these practice problems out yourself. Um, these are uh, essentially um, just some more practice problems as we did with this one over here. So try to find the answer, try to compare with someone um, to make sure that you're on the right track. So the sounds that um, we listen for um, were discovered by Dr. Krotkoff, um, and so we call them the Krotkoff sounds. Um, and so here you can see how this, uh, this technique works. So what we do is we take our um, shvig, uh, shvigmo manometer and we um, wrap it around your arm and basically increase the pressure on it until there's no more blood moving through your arm. Um, so basically you try to you bring that pressure up to about to over 120 millimeters of mercury. Um, so that way we can just cut off that blood um, circulation. Then you slowly start to release the pressure um, and the idea is that once the pressure gets to your blood pressure, or rather lower than your blood pressure a little bit, the blood's gonna flow through, and that's gonna be that first sound that you hear. So that's gonna be your systolic um, blood pressure. Now, you keep letting that deflate, and eventually when it deflates enough um, you're not going to hear the sound anymore and that'll be your diastolic um, blood pressure so this is when it first pushes through this is when basically now your blood is just flowing freely through your um, arteries and that's our diastolic blood pressure um, so here we have it at 120 and here we have it at 70 so we went higher than 120 um, just to really cut off that, um, that blood pressure. Um, we let it drop and we noticed that, okay, at 120 is when we heard our first sound. So that means that blood pressure is about 120 at its highest and that's, um, that's our systolic. And then that sound stopped um, and that's our diastolic. 
So here you can see some measurements about what's normal and um, abnormal um, for both systolic and diastolic. So for example, normal is about less than 120 uh, for systolic and 80, less than 88 for diastolic. But you could have low blood pressure, it's 50 to 90 um, systolic and 35 to 60 diastolic. Um, so um, you can have several conditions. You can have what's called hypotension. Hypotension is when you have low blood pressure. Um, and it's usually not too big of a deal unless you start to feel dizzy or faint because you're not getting your blood circulating fast enough throughout the body. You can have hypertension. Um, that's basically your heart's working really, really hard to push that bl blood through your, um, your arteries. And um, that's not really good for your arteries because it can cause scarring, it can damage them later on. Um, so hypertension, not necessarily a good thing. You should get that checked out. Um, then you can have um, atherosclerosis, which is hardening of the arteries. So if you have hypertension, that can often lead to scarring and um, scarring and uh, uh, of the arteries um, and damaging them, and it'll make them less elastic. They'll harden, um, and eventually that could increase your chance of getting a heart attack or other uh, cardiovascular diseases like a stroke that we discussed in um, the previous uh, presentation on the circulatory system. Uh, so this is an interesting syndrome. It's called the white coat syndrome. So here we have a doctor um, checking your uh, blood pressure. And oftentimes when doctors check the blood pressure, they'll notice it's higher than it actually usually is. Um, so that on average, if you took an average of your blood pressure, um, you might notice that average is actually a little bit lower than what you see at the doctor's office. And that's because people often get scared when they see, well, the doctor measuring the blood pressure. Um, it's just a scary situation to be in, and so um, typically you'll have a higher than normal blood pressure reading at the doctor's office um, when you see that white coat that the doctors wear. So um, make sure that uh, you complete the readings on um, measurements in circulatory system. If we have time, we'll do a lab um, using probes or just using uh, regular pressure um, regular pulse measuring techniques, um, which you can see in this PowerPoint is a picture that allows you to see where to measure your pulse appropriately. Here is a mini investigation that you can do once you're done um, your uh, homework and listening to this video. Um, you can go through the lab technique here in order to um, just experiment um, with your pulse and your beats per minute and to start monitoring this, monitoring this more effectively. What I recommend as well is if you have um, some kind of device like maybe an Apple Watch or a Garmin or a, a Fitbit or any other device that monitors um, heart rate, um, try to compare it to just using your fingers and um, see if they're close to each other in agreement or not. 